<clears throat> good to see everybody tonight. And uh, as always, appreciate your presence and uh, hope our discussion as we get into First Peter uh, in chapter one will be helpful. And as always, y'all feel free to jump in anytime and uh, that you got a comment or question, thought uh, that you want to add to the discussion. I always enjoy uh, hearing from you, and uh, so it won't be a lecture and, and boring. Mm -hmm. So uh, y'all jump in anytime. Um, Israel, I know you weren't here uh, last week when we started. Was it last week when we started or the week before? I guess not two weeks. Uh, I think you were teaching Joel's class. But basically what we did uh, that, that first uh, week, we spent a lot of time on uh, on Peter himself, talking about his background and so forth and where he's mentioned in the, the, the Gospels and where he's mentioned in uh, the rest of uh, the Bible in Galatians and other uh, other places. And then we talked a lot about uh, the book itself, a kind of an overview about the, the perhaps the place of the writing, the date of the writing, the theme of the writing and that sort of thing. So I won't go back and rehash all of that, but uh, that's kind of where we were and we didn't actually get into the text. But I want to read, I want to read the text, uh, read the chapter, and then uh, begin our discussion uh, of it. And as we go through uh, uh, the book of First Peter, just to let you know, I'm using... I'm using uh, Albert Barnes' uh, commentary, B.W. Johnson's commentary, and Wayne Jackson's to kind of collect my thought, thoughts, <clears throat> which all of these are reliable, uh, I think, uh, for the biggest uh, biggest portion. And even though Barnes has the most in-depth, I've got about, not even half of it, it's got 70, about 70 pages. I've got about another, uh, 30, uh, another 65 or 70 to run off. But uh, I won't read every bit of that, of course, but uh, I'm kind of using that and I've kind of marked it up, uh, some of the uh, things that I wanted to uh, bring out in class. And I'm using uh, uh, Wayne Jackson a little bit too. And I'm making, I'm making cop uh, a copy of B.W. Johnson's also where I won't lug that around. To, uh, I'll have just a copy of that one. So, so all of the thoughts are not, uh, not necessarily mine, but uh, I will... Uh, try to make it as coherent as possible as we go through uh, our discussion uh, tonight and through the rest of the discussion of uh, 1 Peter. So let's read it. Uh, let's see, one, two, three, four, five of you guys and uh, 25 verses. So let's, let's split it up. Israel, if you read the first five, Tommy, six through 10, Keith, 11 through 15, uh, Scott, uh, 16 through 20 and Lord 21 through 25 and then we'll go back and start commenting on it. Okay? Yeah. Peter, an apostle of Jesus Christ, to the strangers scattered throughout Pontus, Galatia, Cappadocia, Asia, and Bithynia. Alike according to the foreknowledge of God, the Father, through sanctification of the Spirit unto the obedience and sprinkling of the blood of Jesus Christ, Grace unto you, and peace be multiplied. Blessed be the God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ, who hath, according to his abundant mercy, hath begotten us again unto a lively hope by the resurrection of Jesus Christ from the dead, to an inheritance incorruptible and undefiled, and that fadeth not away, preserved in heaven for you, who are kept by the power of God through faith unto salvation, ready to be revealed. Wherein you greatly rejoice to renown for a season, if need be, you are in heaviness to manifold temptation, that the trial that your faith be much more precious than the gold that perish, that it be tried with fire, might be found unto praise and, and honor and glory at the appearing of Jesus. Who have, who having not yet seen, love and whom, so now you see him not yet believing, rejoice with joy, unspeakable and full of glory, receiving the end of your faith, being the salvation of the soul.
Okay. One more time with we'll verse 10. Yeah. Yep. So with salvation, the prophets have inquired and searched diligently to what sad that the grace that should come unto you. Searching what or what manner of time the Spirit of Christ, which was in them, did signify when it testified beforehand the sufferings of Christ and for the followed, and who it was revealed that not unto themselves, but unto us they did minister the things. Which now reported unto you by them that have preached the gospel unto you, and the Holy Ghost sent out from heaven, which things the angels desire to look into. Wherefore, gird up the loins of your mind, be sober, and hope to the end of the grace that is to be brought unto you at the revelation of Jesus Christ. As obedient children, not fashioning yourselves according to the form of lust and your ignorance, but as he which hath called you is holy, so be ye holy in all manner of conversation. Because it is written, Be ye holy, for I am holy. And if ye call on the Father, who without respect of persons judge us according to every man's work, pass the time, pass the time of your sojourning here in fear. For as much as ye know that ye were not redeemed with corruptible things, <clears throat> silver and gold, from your vain conversation received by tradition from your fathers, but with the precious blood of Christ as of a lamb without spot, without without blemish and without spot, who verily was foreordained before the foundation of the world, but was manifest in these last times for you. Who by him, <clears throat> who by him do believe in God, and raised him up from the dead and gave him glory, that your faith and hope might be in God. Seeing that you have purified your souls and obeyed the truth of the Spirit and to unfailing love of the brethren, see that you love one another with a pure heart fervently. Being born again, not of corruptible seed, but of incorruptible, by the word of God, which liveth and abideth forever. For all flesh is as grass, and all the glory of man as a flower of grass. The grass wither, and the flower thereof falleth away. But the word of the Lord endureth forever. And this is the word for which the gospel is preached unto you. Okay, thank you guys. Appreciate that. Uh, that's kind of interesting in uh, verse 12 to me that uh, even all these things or many of these things, even the angels desire to look into. That's, that's pretty uh, kind of a, a profound statement. Um, when he talks about, when, when he starts out in the first uh, couple of verses, he identifies himself as the author, Peter, an apostle to Jesus Christ. And uh, it's interesting that, uh, you know, when you, when you look at a particular uh, religion that uh, Keith has been talking about in the Sunday morning class uh, about the, uh, the popes and the success of the popes, it's interesting that Peter doesn't identify himself as the pope. Over in 1 Peter 5 and verse 4, uh, the first three or four verses there, 1 Peter 5, uh, he also identifies himself as an elder. So he identifies himself as an apostle and as an elder uh, of the church. So he's not, uh, it's, it's interesting uh, in him and Paul and the others, but particularly those two, uh, you would find uh, uh, them identifying themselves either as an apostle or as a servant, in Paul's case as a prisoner. Different times he talks about being a prisoner of the Lord Jesus Christ or being a servant of the Lord Jesus Christ, being an apostle of the Lord Jesus Christ, called to be an apostle uh, of the Lord and so forth and so on. And in reference to Peter, you remember, uh, you remember in Acts uh, chapter 10, uh, down about verse uh, 25 and 26, when Cornelius comes to him, and you remember Cornelius bowed down to worship him, and what did Peter say? Stand up, I'm a man myself. Stand up, I'm a man myself. So that's kind of interesting to me, just kind of a side note, or a little bit of a, a tidbit there, when he identifies himself as an apostle, uh, not some superior being, uh, uh, or anything like that, 
Uh, also, uh, we found a reference to Paul in uh, Acts 14. Uh, you remember in uh, verses, I think it's about 11 through 15, you remember when he uh, healed the, the impotent man at Lystra, and they thought that he was a god and so forth and so on, and he said, no, I'm, I'm just a person of like passions as you are. Uh, so even the Apostle Paul, a chosen vessel that Jesus said he was, and yet he said, I'm a man just like you are. You're not going, I'm not a God. You don't fall in to worship me and so forth and so on. It was interesting to me and looking this up in uh, Acts uh, 22, I believe it's verse, verses 8 and 9, where it talks about even an angel, even an angel is not to be worshiped. So that's another reference. And that's pretty high up in the pecking order if you get to thinking about it, uh, an angel of God. Uh, even here he says, an angel desired look at some of the things that uh, Peter is uh, talking about here with the Holy Ghost sent down from heaven and so forth and so on. And even an angel in Acts uh, 22 uh, is not to be worshipped. So Peter uh, identifies himself uh, as one sent, which is, uh, which is uh, uh, what the apostle, uh, what apostle refers to, what the apostle means. And he, he addresses the strangers or the elect to the, uh, uh, to the strangers scattered abroad, the elect, and so forth. There's a, uh, a little difference of opinion, as, and we won't dwell on it, but as to who the elect or who the strangers were. He talks about those in Pontus and Galatia, Cappadocia, Asia, and Bithynia. Uh, and, of course, these were, uh, these were uh, areas that Paul had evangelized. Three of these, I uh, believe the, the three that, uh, that I looked up had reference to, Pontus, Cappadocia, and Asia are also mentioned in Acts 2 in the, the, the category of 15 or 16 either countries or areas uh, that were at uh, Pentecost there in Jerusalem uh, in uh, Acts chapter 2. These three uh, were, uh, were mentioned as being there at that particular point in time. But the, the, the reference here uh, uh, to the strangers or pilgrims, that word is used, uh, strangers and or pilgrims, used three times uh, in the New Testament. Uh, I think it's uh, Hebrews 11, 13, 1 Peter 2, 11, and this verse. And uh, there's a little difference of opinion about who he's talking about. Is he talking about Jews who have been converted to Christianity and were scattered abroad or dispersed? Uh, some think that's what the reference is. Some think it's just Christians in general uh, without any reference to Jews particularly because in 1 Peter 4, he mentions the word Gentile. So the, the indication is there's probably some of both in the category that he's talking about, those that were scattered abroad uh, because of persecution or impending persecution that he's going to talk about a little bit later down about verse 6 and 7 and 8 uh, of this uh, same chapter. So the strangers or sojourners, uh, these are those that were away from their native land, whoever the category is. But uh, in general, you can sum it up, I think, to, just to say that as Christians, regardless of whether it was Jews who had been converted to Christianity or Gentiles uh, who had been uh, converted to, uh, uh, to uh, Christianity, uh, as I mentioned, the Gentiles are mentioned in 1 Peter 4, 3 and 4, uh, so the indication is that uh, he has both categories or just Christians in mind uh, that he's writing to uh, here. So uh, the word elect, let's look at that just a little bit. Uh, you can use the word chosen or you can use the word predestinated. And we're going to talk about that just a little bit. Certainly not in the, not in the sense that Calvin uh, talked about. Uh, of predestination, but elect means that they were chosen, and they were chosen, of course, before uh, the foundation of the world, uh, and so they were, in fact, chosen. But let's look at that just a little bit about uh, what he's actually referring to. Uh, here, he's not referring necessarily to uh, the purpose for which they were chosen at this particular point in time. He's going to talk about that a little bit uh, later, uh, but it's applied to the people of God as being chosen out of the world and called to be his. Uh, so sometimes when you, uh, of course, Calvin got off uh, track there where he talked about, you know, some were chosen 
to be saved, some are chosen to be lost, and so forth and so on. Keith had mentioned this in his uh, class there a while back about if that's the case, why would Jesus say, go into all the world and preach the gospel to every creature? He that believes that is baptized shall be saved, and so forth. If you want to go back, uh, Matthew 28, 19 and 20, Mark 16, 15 and 16. If you want to go back to Revelation 22, 17, whosoever will, let him come and take the water of life freely and so forth and so on. Uh, so, so when he's talking about chosen, he's not talking about that we have nothing to do with being chosen, we have nothing to do with being elected, right opposite to that. And what did he say in Second Peter 3, 9? He's not... Concerning promises, not going to things you've heard, long-suffering towards Yeah, not waiting that any should perish. perish. Not waiting that any should perish, but that all should come uh, to repentance. And uh, we mentioned Matthew 28, 19, Mark 16, 15, uh, Revelation 22, 17. So the whosoever will would accomplish everyone. And so uh, the, and Joel mentions a lot, a lot of times the, the, the verse in Hebrews, Hebrews 5, 8, and 9, that though he were son, yet learned he will be, if other things that suffered, then made perfect, uh, he became the author of eternal salvation to all those that obey him. So that would negate uh, the, the idea of being predestined to the point that you have nothing to do with your salvation. Just that God elected the system. Absolutely. That's the whole point. Not the individual. Not the individual. Right. So it's not like Israel was selected, not what, you know, kind of thing. And and that's that's where Calvin, I think, um, got off the, the track. Or the hundred and forty four thousand that some talk about in in Revelation that and it's just that many is gonna be saved and, and nobody else and negating the and the multitudes and so forth and so on, two or three verses after that very a statement. Go ahead, Kevin. Brother Joel's author mentioned other people in there also. The uh, idea that it was an elitist mindset that John Calvin had among this, you know, that the elite are the ones that are chosen. Yeah. I, I never really thought yeah. about that. It's in, yeah, and it's interesting in, uh, is it First John 5, 13, that you can know that you have eternal life? And I wonder, uh, I wonder if those that were chosen or the ones that weren't chosen, how do you know that? I just wonder how you how do you know how do you know that you're among the chosen or how do you know that you're not among the chosen? You can That's almost right. use the word Christian to the word elect right there. Right. Same people. Absolutely. Talking about same people. Mm -hmm. Absolutely. And as Israel says, he's talking about a category or a group uh, that he's going to save for those that are obedient to his will. Uh Many are called, he, few chosen. Boy, he also said that he predetermined that Christians would be right. his people. Who's a Christian is our choice. We yeah. choose to be. Absolutely. Person. Absolutely. We can talk about that in our school Bible class in Romans. The older and older talks about that idea of, you know, that, that we, it is it's not about a bi biological thing. We were born a Jew, but. Romans 9 verse 8 says it's not the children of flesh that are his children, but the children of promise. So if we come to God as Abraham did, if we are obedient of faith. Yeah, absolutely. It's predestined. It's predestined. Right. Absolutely. Absolutely. Let's look at a, a couple of verses real quick along that same line that you talk about. Look at uh, 1 Peter 2 and verse 9. Notice it. But ye are a chosen generation. And he goes on royal priesthood, peculiar people, and so forth. And two others I want to read. Uh, Israel, look, look up Romans 8, uh, 28 through 30, if you would. And uh, Keith, look at uh, 2 Thessalonians 2 and verse 13. And Lord, if you would, look at Ephesians 1, 4, and 5. And let's read those when you guys are ready. We know that all good things work together for good to them that love God them who are called according to his purpose. From whom he did foreknow, he also did predestinate to be conformed to the image of his Son, that he might be the firstborn among many brethren. Moreover, whom he did predestinate, them, he also called, and whom he called, them he also justified, and whom he justified, them he also glorified. 
Okay. You want to explain that one? <laughs> so who did he justify? Who did he call? Who, who was the elect? Who was sanctified or set apart? Who was glorified? Well, that whole group of people that we're talking about, right? The whole predestinated system. The God system. Before the foundation of the world, Ephesians four through seven. Yep. You know, this was absolutely absolutely absolutely. T three uh, Second Thessalonians two thirteen real quick. We're about to give thanks always to God for you, brethren, beloved of the Lord, because God hath from the beginning chosen you to salvation through sanctification of the Spirit and belief of the truth. Which he called you by our gospel with your okay. of the glory of our Lord Jesus Christ. Absolutely. So there's something then on our part then through sanctification, something that sets us apart, or those who would be set apart, or those who would be uh, sanctified, uh, as as you said, uh, Israel, the, the talking about a uh, a system or a group. Uh, Keith had reference to that as well. So he's not talking about an individual necessarily because you can't reject it. He, we still have free will to accept it or to reject it. And uh, uh, it sheds a little more light on it, not really more light on it, because that's about as clear as it can get. But Lord, read Ephesians 1, uh, 4 and 5. He has chosen us to him before the foundation of the world, that we should be holy without blame before him in love, having predestined us into the adoption of children by Jesus Christ to himself, according to the good pleasure of his will. Yeah, it's interesting that the, the little prepositional phrase, in him, chosen us in him. Well, how do we get into in him? Well, Galatians 3, 26, 27, uh, the verses would point that out. He's chosen us in him. He's chosen us because of what his son did uh, on the cross. And I think that's, if you put all that together, then we can see, uh, I think, what he's referring to uh, there that... Uh, He's talking about a group of people who would be, as, as Keith was talking about, would be obedient to the faith. And he mentions that also, and I think Keith mentioned this a while back in his class too, in Romans 1 verse 5, where it talks about obedience. And then right at the end, in Romans 16, he said, said the same thing. He uses the word obey or obedience. From beginning to end in Romans, he talks about uh, that. He uses the word obey or, or obedience. So uh, those, that, uh, those that he foreknew, would be those that would be would, would come to him and so forth and so on. And since it was in the beginning or before anything else happened, as the Lord was reading there Ephesians chapter 1, uh, we, we can look at it this way. Look at it kind of like Isaiah did. Isaiah uh, has a statement actually that God himself uh, is making in Isaiah 46 and verse 10, where he says, God declares the end from the beginning. So did he, could he foresee down the stream of time, what was going to happen? Absolutely. I mean, in the beginning was the Word, the Word was with God, the Word was God, and so forth. Verse 14 uh, there in, uh, in John uh, 1 talks about it, and, and the Word became flesh throughout the August, and we bailed His glory, and so forth. So, so God could see who it was. So He could see who would be chosen. He could see uh, those, He could see down the stream of time where you, you and I, the six guys in this class, what we're going to do. And Albert Barnes goes into a lot of uh, thing about what the word foreknew or what it could mean, but he, he I won't read all that, but he kind of sums it up this way. The simple fact here affirmed, which no one can deny, is that there was foreknowledge in the case on the part of God. The essential idea here is that the original choice on the part of God, and not on their part at that particular point in time, that this choice was founded on what he before knew to be best. He undoubtedly saw good and sufficient reasons why the choice should fall on them. And then he goes on, he said, I cannot, uh, I do not know the reasons why why he did it, uh, why I didn't know that the reason why he did it are revealed or that they could be fully comprehended by us if they were. It kind of goes back to that word, the, the statement that he makes in John 3, 16. How do you, how do you define the word so? For God so loved the world that he gave his son. How do you define that adverb? So he, God loved the world, loved as a verb. God loved the world. But that little adverb there, God so loved the world. In the beginning of time, he, he, he had this plan of salvation from Ephesians 1 that Lord read a while ago in the other passages uh, to indicate that God knew what he was going to do 
from the beginning. And he can see the end from the beginning, as uh, Isaiah said in Isaiah 46. But there's something on our part. Through sanctification of the Spirit, he says, or the Holy Spirit, the third person uh, in the Godhead, that it was by his, uh, uh, by, by this influence or the agency, as it were, of the Holy Spirit. Uh, Barnes goes into it a little bit uh, uh, where he talks about, though we're sinners, uh, he proposes to save us, but we're not saved in our sins. Uh, of course, if that were the case, you'd have Calvin's doctrine coming in that it didn't matter how you live. You couldn't do anything about it one way or the other. Uh, if you're a sinner, you know, because we all have sinned and trans transgressed, all, all fall short of the glory of God in that sense. But, uh, but what uh, Barnes says here, which I think we'd all agree with, he says that in our case, uh, we were talking about a while ago, how do you know? that we, we uh, have to have evidence uh, that we are born again. And, of course, one way that we can know that is Romans 6, uh, 3 and 4, that we're baptized uh, and we come up in, as the Bible would describe it, in newness of life or a new creature, a new creation. So when you and I have done what the Bible tells us to do, to be a new creation, uh, then we know that we have been sanctified or set apart, uh, as it were, unto the word obedience, unto obedience and sprinkling of the blood of Jesus Christ. So, of course, that has reference to his death. It has reference, a reference to his, uh, his shedding of his blood. And I won't read it. I was going to read it, but uh, just as a reference. Uh, Hebrews 9, 18 through 23, and also verses 25 and 26, and also Hebrews 12 and 24, where it talks about without the shedding of blood, there is no remission. So you and I uh, would come in contact uh, uh, with his blood and uh, as a result uh, would be, uh, would be uh, a new creation or a new creature. Go ahead, Lord. That word unto is influence is acute talking about a class or maybe the class you're talking about the difference between unto and into. into. It was Joel. Was it Joel? Yeah, it was. I heard it. I couldn't remember what I heard. It, it just says into the adoption of children. So he brought you the predestined right up to the adoption. But to get into it is through the good will of Jesus Christ. Which Something that, which right. Obedience. So, yeah. so every time I run into that into or unto, I think about it. I think it For by grace are you saved through faith, as it were, Ephesians 2, verse 8. Uh, well, when Keith was using it, he was referring to the end zone. You get unto the end zone or into the end zone, uh, you will uh, you'll be successful. But if you don't get into it, you're not going to win. Yeah. So. Anybody want to comment? Yeah, 1969, I know we got into the end zone against Fairhope. Chestnut got in, but the official said, said no. We lost the game rather than winning the game. But anyway, that's, that's the side of our deal. When that happened, pitch five years ago? I don't know why I remember that. Yeah. No. I, he was in there. I know he was. Okay. Then uh, grace unto you and peace be multiplied. In other words, may it abound. May it uh, is, is conferred on you abundantly, uh, as it were. So we, we have evidence. Uh, uh, we have evidence that God has uh, chosen us or the group of people that we in, as Keith mentioned, Christians. That, that we, we have evidence about that. And another reference to that is Romans 1 and verse 7 where he says that we are called to be saints. And this happened way back uh, in, in the early annals, way back before the world was created. But Paul mentions that in Romans 1, verse 7, that we are called to be saints. Uh, and two verses prior to that, he talks about the, the aspect or the idea of being obedient uh, there in Romans 1, and verse 5. So... Barnes mentions this, all the proof which any man can have that he is among the chosen of God is to be found in the evidence 
of personal piety. In other words, any, any man who is willing to be a true Christian may have all that evidence in his own case. So you and I, we talk about, well, how do you know? Well, you and I can know. First, first John 5, verse 13 that we alluded to earlier, you and I can know. We can be assured. Uh, what well, we sang that song sometimes, Blessed Assurance. You, you, and I can, you and I can be assured of it based on, on what the Bible uh, tells us to do. Let me, uh, let me read uh, just a statement through real quick from Johnson and, and from uh, Wayne Jackson. Israel, this is what I uh, covered two weeks ago at, uh, on Peter. Uh, where B.W. Johnson says, uh, the first letter of Peter opens, as do the other apostolic letters. Peter claims no superiority. Uh, the New Testament knows nothing of his succession to Christ as the first pope. And then he goes on, in, uh, and when he talks about the poor knowledge of God, their election and salvation was in accordance with God's predetermined purpose to save men through the gospel and hence according to his foreknowledge. This is kind of what y'all were saying. D.W. Johnson sums it up more succinctly, I think, than, uh, than Barnes does. And then he mentions this idea of the sanctification of the Spirit. Uh, the means by which they become elect are pointed out. They were separated from the world by the gospel, the word of the Spirit, a sanctification which signifies a setting apart to holy uses. They were thus separated unto obedience and sprinkling of the blood of Jesus Christ. In obeying this, they were baptized into the death of Christ, and we mentioned Romans uh, 6, 1 through 4, and their sins were pardoned. The sanctification, uh, in this case, precedes obedience and pardon. What he's saying is, it was predetermined before the world was that this would be the way that they would be sanctified. I think that's what he's saying there. And then... Uh, just a couple things from uh, Wayne Jackson, just real quick. Uh, let me sum it up this way. Let me jump down. Um, and this kind of goes back to what Israel said a while ago. He says, uh, the opening statement identifies the author as Peter, an apostle of Christ. The recipients are the elect. Christians are, are frequently referred to as God's elect or chosen. This does not mean that each child of God was specifically chosen which is what you were talking about, is before the foundation of the world for salvation, while others were arbitrarily predestined for condemnation, as Calvinism contends. How absurd it is to argue that God commissioned the gospel to be preached to every creature when a vast number had already been chosen for eternal damnation. The truth is, God chose a type of person. This is referring to what you were saying. You must have read Wayne Jackson. Yes, sir. Or you had that, that thought yourself. The one who is obedient in disposition, who had himself determined to enter the in Christ relationship, Ephesians 1, 4 that we talked about, chose us in him by obedience to the truth. And then the letter was designed to be read by the uh, churches in five provinces of Asia Minor. And by the way, that Asia doesn't mean the Asia that is one of the continents. It's, uh, it's one of the five provinces that, uh, like Cappadocia or Galatia that he was talking about there. Um, the Christian movement of which they were a part was planned by God before the world existed and it resulted in the sanctification or the setting apart of these folks in the service of God by means of the Spirit's instruction. Such led uh, to their obedience at which point the cleansing effect of Christ's blood was applied on their behalf. And so that's, I think that kind of sums up what, uh, what uh, we were talking about there, what you guys had mentioned uh, earlier. All right, uh, any thoughts, anybody, before we get into verse 3? Mr. what is that <clears throat> sprinkling of the blood of Jesus Christ? What, what is that there's, a, there's another verse, Lord, that I, I wanted to, uh, that I had down about that, that, that mentions that word. I think it's, I think I, I referred to it a while ago, but uh, I think it's just talking about the shedding of Christ's blood because over in, uh, in Hebrews 12, I believe, Lord, that same expression is used. Well, let me, let me just go back real quick to Hebrews 9 because it kind of ties it together. Hebrews 9, uh, let me just read this, and I think this was uh, this would help a little bit because um, it used the word sprinkle in Hebrews 9. Uh, let me just go ahead and read this. Uh, 
start in Hebrews 9, Lord, verse 18. Whereupon neither the first testament was dedicated without blood, but when Moses had spoken every precept to all the people according to the law, he took the blood of calves and of goats with water and scarlet wool and hyssop and sprinkled both the book and all the people, saying, This is the blood of the testament which God hath enjoined unto you. Moreover, he sprinkled with blood both the tabernacle and all the vessels of the ministry, and almost all things are by the law purged with blood, and without shedding of blood, there is no remission. And then talk about Christ entering into, and then, then down to verse 25 of Hebrews 9 says, Nor yet that he should offer himself often as the high priest entered into the holy place every year with blood of others, for then must he often have suffered since the foundation of the world. But now once in the end of the world hath he appeared to put away sin by the sacrifice of himself, and then, uh, Lord, in Hebrews 12, it uses the same expression, Hebrews 12 and verse 24, and to Jesus, the mediator of the new covenant, and to the blood of sprinkling that speaketh better things than that of Abel. So I don't know uh, the, the word sprinkle there. I think it just has reference to the shedding of his blood is, is the way that I understand it. And it's used. We know that he was sprinkled in the tabernacle and walked in the Yes. Yeah. In that way. Hebrews, yeah. Hebrews 10 22 says, uh, Let us draw you with a true heart, full assurance that they have a heart sprinkled from evil conscience and their bodies washed with pure water. And so to me, you see the text from water and blood right there. The body's washed with water and the blood is applied to our heart and our soul. That offends our soul. Yeah. So, okay. So <clears throat> some, some would probably take that and say, Well, that means that, that we can sprinkle, you know, as as a part of baptism, but that's not what he's referring to there. So I think he's talking about the shedding of blood, and Steve talked about there in Hebrews 10. Just that right. was entered, it says sprinkler instead of the pouring out. Well, yeah. That's, that's the idea. Blood was sprinkled on the tabernacle. And it gave us the same uh, thing. Uh, yeah. Set apart the same thing as Brother Keith is saying. All of this seeds of sanctification. Yeah. That's made possible by that sprinkler. And it compares that to his blood. It compares that to the blood of Christ. Yeah. If the church was sprinkled, if you will, which not, not in terms of no, baptism, yeah. but the sanctification of the whole thing. Okay, I think I got you. By his blood, yeah. And I baptized into, like, we know that's how we did it, but the whole system was sanctified. That, you know, along yeah. the same thing with Brother Keith. Yeah. yeah, so you got three or, four, three or four times there the word sprinkle is used, but I think it, I think the whole thing just it was in reference to the fact that. He shed his blood through his death. That, that's what I get out of it. All right, uh, verse 3. Blessed be the God and Father of the Lord Jesus Christ, which according to his abundant mercy hath begotten us again unto a living or lively hope by the resurrection of Jesus Christ from the dead. So again, he's talking about sanct uh, the the sanctifying or the sanctification through sanctification of the spirit and the blood of Jesus Christ that he's talking about in verse 2 and he did I think he just uh, carries it a little bit further to say that it was God's mercy that he sent his son and we didn't have any claim to be redeemed we were the ones who went astray a man went astray so we have no claim on it, but because of his abundant mercy that he shed on us, he has begotten us again. So what, what Peter is saying in his case and those that he was writing to was that they had been begotten again. In other words, for them, that's past tense. In other words, it, it's happened. It's kind of like in Colossians 1, 3, about, uh, Colossians 1, 13, about he translated us out of the, Darkness in the kingdom of his dear son. In other words, it's happened. Uh, it's forecast, but now in Colossians 1 13, Paul said it's happened. So, what Peter's saying here is to you, the strangers that are scattered abroad, you have been begotten again. You have been sanctified. You have been set apart. Uh, and I think that's what he's uh, referring to there. And, and of course, uh, Barnes and his others talked about. The, the being begotten or being born again, and they have reference to John 3, uh, 3 and 5, where Jesus told Nicodemus, except a man be born again, be, be born of water and the Spirit. I won't get into all that because we, 
Uh, we, we had that one way back. But what he's saying is that we have been born again. You and I have been baptized into Christ. We are born again. We are a new creature. Uh, and, and Barnes kind of mentions the fact that he begot us first physically. So we're the reason, uh, he's the reason we're here physically. And now we've been born again spiritually, as it were, not physically, did not enter into our mother's womb a second time, as uh, Nicodemus asked uh, uh, the question, but, uh, but rather it's a spiritual rebirth or spiritual birth, uh, as it were, uh, and, and, and to a lively hope, or some of the commentators, I think, or translations say the word living, a living hope or live, uh, lively hope. And of course, we know that one hope is Ephesians 4, 4, where the seven ones that are mentioned there uh, uh, talks about the, the hope that we have. And of course, he, he's talking about the hope that we have because of Christ's death on the cross, uh, 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 being obedient to his death on the cross and, and by the fact that he was resurrected from the dead. And we're going to want to look at that a little bit in, in terms of of uh, what I said in First Corinthians, we'll get into that uh, next week then. First Corinthians 15, 1 through 4, particularly in 12 through 20 of First Corinthians 15, talked about the hope that we have because of the resurrection. If we, if, if he wasn't raised, we are of all men most miserable, but Paul affirmed that we've seen him. He, he mentioned several people there and several categories of people and even the 500 that he mentions and, and even James, he said, the last of all he's seen of me, I, I saw him. So, uh, so we know that he's raised from the dead, and since he has, then you and I have this hope also. He's, he's going to bring us with him, as he mentioned in First Thessalonians 4, 14, and other places uh, as well. Thank you, guys. Appreciate your good attention, your good comments. Appreciate that much.